baby boy chosen to be born vulnerable into a dangerous world. And so God, into the joy and coziness of Christmas, we ask you to bring your message of truth and honesty because, Lord, we experience the world in so many other ways other than warm and cozy and cheery and merry and bright. We thank you that the gospel is for that world and is for us. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning again. Before I dive into the word, uh, I need to, to say a word of... Um, I don't know, what is it, royalty? Um, I, I think I said a few weeks ago that this sermon series that we were doing through Advent was a collaborative effort. Um, we did a series back last January, a year ago, so you probably don't remember it, called Awe. <laughs> and we talked about the awe of God and how we experience Him in worship. And uh, that was a collaborative effort with several pastors from Baldwin County and several pastors from Mobile County all working together. And uh, this Advent series that we have been going through is called Traveling on a Promise. And it's a series that I worked with Jim Kinder on, the pastor of Orange Beach United Methodist Church, and one of his associates, a deacon named Emily Kincaid. And uh, Jim and Emily and I um, all worked on this series together, and there were certain weeks that each one of us uh, took more ownership of in the writing process. And the reason I share this with you today is because last Sunday, I got a lot of positive feedback. Uh, and one of the pieces of positive feedback was, man, I've, I've just never heard the, the Christmas story summarized in, in such a, a good way, a helpful, clear way. And I have to say that if you notice me looking down at my notes a lot, it's because that portion that you thought was the best was one that I did not write. So I have to thank Jim Kinder. Uh, I really stuck closely to his language on a lot of it because I felt the same way you did. It was just so good that I really wanted to, uh, to share it in the way that he wrote it and the way that we uh, worked on together. So I will pass your good feedback on to Jim and Emily as well. But today we're going to continue this journey as we talk about God doing new things in old places. We're going to turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2. And we may seem to be doing this a little bit backwards, and that's okay. Uh, actually, the lectionary, which we don't always follow, which is kind of a prescribed set of, of readings and uh, selected text to preach from, has this passage today in Matthew 2, verses 13 through 23, and then verses 1 through 12 next week, which happens to be what Wes is going to preach on. And uh, we had planned it that way before we knew we were following the lectionary. So there's actually a reason, a rhyme to our madness. But we're going to pick up after the Magi have visited the Christ child in verse 13. And the words will be on the screen, or you can read out of your Bible. When the Magi had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. And Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi. He was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea, in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is an amazing part of the Christmas story, is it not? We don't see this part on many Hallmark cards. 
Matthew wants to share details of Jesus' life in a way that the other Gospels don't quite. Uh, N.T. Wright points out in his commentary, Matthew, for everyone, that before the Prince of Peace had learned to walk and talk, he was a homeless refugee with a price on his head. Merry Christmas. And of all places, Jesus the refugee, the fugitive Messiah, is hiding for his life in Egypt, the very land of evil oppression from which the Israelite slaves had been delivered by God. Doesn't that seem ironic? And Matthew's is the only gospel that records it. Why? Well, because Matthew has a goal not shared by the other gospel writers. You see, Matthew wants to point to Christ in particular as the fulfillment of all Jewish prophecy. He wants to tell the story, the promises of God, and show that in Jesus those promises are fulfilled. He wants to prove Jesus' credentials as the Messiah. And do you know what the word uh, Messiah means? Actually, do you know what the word Messiah is in Greek? It's Christos, Christ. And so when we say Jesus Christ, we're not saying that Jesus had a last name. We're saying that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the promised one, the long-awaited hope of God's people, Jesus, the Nazarene. Hosea 11, chapter 1, is where Matthew gets his first prophecy. Did you hear how many prophecies were in that short passage we read together? And did you hear how many times God sent an angel to appear to Joseph and the Magi in the form of dreams? That God is giving warnings, that he's directing his faithful and guiding them in what to do. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. That's interesting because that's looking back on a story that we call the exodus, the exit or escape from Egypt where God delivered his people who had become a whole nation, but there arose a Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph, their ancestor, and that Pharaoh enslaved and oppressed the people of God. And God's faithfulness is told over and over again through the Old Testament in this refrain, Remember, I am the Lord your God, the one who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. What's interesting is if you stay in Hosea chapter 11 and read down just a few verses in verse 5, it says, Will they not return to Egypt? And will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? And so what we're learning through the prophet is that there's this pattern that God's people find themselves in a place of slavery and God delivers them. But do you know that even when you get slaves out of Egypt, it is sometimes hard to get Egypt out of them. And the people of God so often, ourselves included, return to our place of bondage. And God says, will they not return Will they not be ruled over because why? Because they refuse to repent. They refuse to turn away from that lifestyle and fully embrace the life that I want for them. Why did the Messiah need to go to Egypt only to come out again? We don't know how long Jesus was in Egypt, um, but it's believed that he was probably there the first couple of years of his life. He was there long enough that the Coptic Christians in Egypt still today have all kinds of memorials and places of sacredness to honor his time there as Egypt protected God's Messiah. The reason Jesus had to go to Egypt only to come out again is because Jesus is the embodiment of God's people. That means that Jesus embodies the redeemed. He embodies God's promises. He embodies God's salvation. So Jesus embodies God's people He embodies God's promises, and he embodies God's salvation. Jesus is the new Israel. Jesus acts on Israel's behalf, lives Israel's story. He is the embodiment of the redeemed, and at the same time, he is the redeemer. He is God made flesh. He is God with us, Emmanuel. His very name, Yeshua, means God saves or God is salvation. Jesus is the embodiment of God's salvation. And did you know that Jesus is also the new Moses? 
Jesus is the new law giver. Jesus has come to show us the full fulfillment of God's law, the embodiment of what it means to love God with our whole being and love our neighbor as ourself. In Jesus, God does new things in old places. Egypt is the land of slavery. It's the place where you don't even know what freedom looks like because it's the environment, the behavior patterns, the structures and systems that spell bondage for you. It's the place where you're oppressed to the point that every day looks the same, but at least you know where you are. It's familiar. And it's home, even though it's a little slice of hell on earth. And the crazy thing is, no sooner had God, through Moses, started leading the Israelites out of Egypt than they wanted to go back. Exodus 16, verses 1 through 3 says, The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. How easy it is to grumble at our leaders. I'm not talking about you to me. I'm talking about us to our leaders. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you brought us out in this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Where are we going? When are we going to get there? And for heaven's sake, what are we going to eat? That's why we fed you before worship today. We didn't want you (laughs) saying those things. But sometimes, like the Israelites, we want to have our faith in Egypt too. But we can't fully enjoy the promised life God has for us until we are out of Egypt and Egypt is out of us. For some of us, Egypt is a place of a traumatic event. It's a relationship broken or lost. It's a place of hurt. It's a place of fear. What we needed to know in that moment was that we were not alone, but it felt like we were and we still live as if we were. For some of us, Egypt is the place of our own worst mistake It can be a place of regret or guilt or shame. Whatever it is, whatever is that moment or that place, it left its mark on us, a mark that we continue to carry with us even as we seek to live the promised land life in a new place. Unfortunately, we carry Egypt with us. I'm preaching to someone today. We may be out of Egypt but we can't fully enjoy the promised life God has for us until Egypt gets out of us. Now, let me be clear. I am not suggesting that we go back to our places of trauma, that we relive the very events that have scarred us, our worst moments, re-enter abusive relationships, or go back to places of temptation or even sin. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is that sometimes we need God to perform what's called the healing of memories so that slavery in our past doesn't keep us from experiencing freedom in our present and our future. I knew a young person that actually experienced this, the healing of memories. She was actually in a worship service, and when she was a child, something scary had happened. Uh, It was also dangerous. It was an event that happened with her mother that made her feel insecure and unsafe. She felt alone in that moment. And many times our trauma produces reactions in us, whether that's a behavior pattern or an addiction or some form of coping. And hers manifested itself in perfectionism that started in childhood and, and carried with her through young adulthood. And then one day she was in church experiencing worship, and the Holy Spirit brought that memory back up to her He wasn't making her relive the trauma. Rather, God began to show her how he had protected her in that moment. He showed her how he had assigned angels to her and her mother in that event and how he had absolutely been present with her in an overwhelming way. And this moment in worship allowed her to have closure over something that had been an issue in her life for years. The event was still a part of her past, part of her story, but now she was free from it in a way that she never had been. That part of Egypt no longer had power over her. That's how God does new things in old places. I am experiencing new things in old places. 
I'm experiencing new patterns in old relationships. I'm experiencing new possibilities of behaving and relating that are teaching me I'm not a slave to ways that I learn to behave and relate out of a deep place within me that is not Christ in me. And I would say that I'm growing up. And some might say, that's good for you. (laughs) I've already done my growing up. Or if I haven't grown up by now, it probably isn't going to happen. And you know what? If it were all about them, those people saying those things, they might be right. But this isn't about them or me or you. It's not about the old or the young. It's not about the optimist or the skeptic. It's about Jesus. And if your life is in him, this is who he is. And this is what he does. Behold, he says, the one who sits on the throne and says, I am making all things new. Revelation 21.5. Behold, I am making all things new. Nothing is off limits. Not your past, not those memories that haunt you, not those ways that you have failed and you cannot forgive yourself. Not those ways that others have hurt you and made you tell stories your whole life of what a victim you are. Not those ways that make you feel scared and insecure and alone. Even those I am making new. You are never too old or too far gone to experience new things in old places. I know because I have met friends in Scripture, friends named Noah Abraham and Sarah, Moses, David, who was still struggling to get out of being a failed parent while he was running from one of his grown children. You ever think that when your children are grown, that's just it? You failed as a parent. If you haven't got it right, there's no redemption. God says that's not true. Behold, I'm making all things new. I've even met some friends recently, gotten to know them better, named Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were not too old to believe God could do new things in old places. In Christ, God has always and will always call his children out of their respective Egypts. And the question today is, will you hear his call? Will you hear his call and will you believe that with the sea in front of you and an army behind, he is still a God who parts the sea? One of my favorite verses in the Exodus story is in Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Moses answers the people as they're sandwiched between their past and they see no future. And Moses says, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you You need only be still. I love that verse. Don't you love that? Whatever sea you're looking at, whatever army you feel threatening you, God says, I will fight for you. You need only be still and trust me. Any spiritual control freaks, don't raise your hand. God says, quit fighting. Let me enter that place. Let me fight for you. Let me show you that I am with you. I was with you. I will always be with you. So here's what I want to invite you to do today. Today is December 29th. We have a few more days of 2019 before we begin a new year. Will you join me in believing that you can be your freest and best self in Christ this coming year? Will you join me in believing that? Will you join me in the hope that if we are always growing in Christ, if God's kingdom is always advancing, things are not getting worse, contrary to the news, they are actually getting better because the best is yet to come. God has already started his work in Christ, and we are getting closer every day to the full culmination of that work where the kingdom that's been inaugurated is finally consummated. And if so, if you're willing to even risk it, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home today, before the sun sets on this day, 
And I want you to spend just a few minutes talking to God. Just spend a few minutes with him and ask him if there's a memory that needs to heal, a place of regret that needs redemption, a place of loneliness that needs assurance of his presence, a place of guilt or shame that needs forgiveness, a place of bitterness that needs to forgive. Will you ask him to reveal it to you? And then will you let him deal with it? Will you give him permission to do new things in old places because that's part of the Christmas story and it may just be a gift that God's been waiting to give you. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this day, for this day. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it because we have heard a message of hope that you are never finished with us. There are never scars that are completely done over that can't be revisited and fully healed in you. Lord, there is nothing that you are not greater than and more powerful than. Our worst fear, our most haunting memory, our most hopeless situation all of the things that make us feel like we have failed and may not measure up to all that you lived and died for us to be. Thank you, God, that even when we have so little faith, even when we give up on ourselves and give up on you, you never give up on us. Your power is made perfect in our weakness. Your grace promises to be sufficient for every day, and you are still the God who heals you are still the God that went back into our place of spiritual slavery and said, let my people go. God, speak that word today. As we prepare to close one year and enter another, whatever Egypt has a hold of us,